So everybody, we uh, just finished this project over here behind me. I'll spin around so you can see this. This is the customer's uh, custom table they wanted. It's a bar top, 42 inch. Uh, did some nice industrial legs for their table here. Great project, and we wrapped that up, got it in paint, the customer's coming to pick it up. So then we moved on to the next set of projects here. So I've got a bunch of signs we're doing on the plasma table, uh, a bunch of garden signs and slogans and cute sayings for a local orchard. So we're sitting here running along and all of a sudden the plasma table makes this rather explosive grinding sounding noise and I shut everything down, hit the E stop, come on over and uh, I come over to this side and I notice that there's a belt just, hang, just hanging down on the plasma table. So uh, pull the motor off and let me get back over to the bench here and uh, the stepper motor uh, basically you know, had a problem. So let me get set up on the bench and uh, we'll go over the stepper motor and uh, show you what, what came and we're gonna see if we can fix it. I don't know if we can or not, but we'll find out because uh, up until I fix it, that table is completely out of commission. So here's the motor off the plasma table. So we're gonna play the guess what's wrong with that motor game. So uh, the motor runs, the motor turns, the motor spins. Uh, it functions perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong electrically with this motor. So uh, as you're watching here, it'll show you the motor. There's the uh, side that faces the plasma table. There's the back side of the motor with the cable and of course the NEMA 23 housing. Okay, so this motor had this uh, gear pulley on the end that drives a toothed belt that you know, moves the carriage along the plasma table. So this motor drives this gear. There's nothing there. I have never seen this happen before, but the shaft actually sheared completely off that motor. So I was looking at that and I've got some drill rod and this is a quarter inch. And I thought, oh, this, this should be easy. It's some drill rod and maybe we can replace this. We'll find out what's going on. Um, this is non-magnetic, which leads me to believe it's probably stainless. So I've got some stainless. I got some 303 uh, it marked here. It says, wow, right? But that's really 303. Okay. So we've got some stainless, but it's a little bit too large. It's in metric. I can't remember exactly what size it is, but it's a little bit bigger than this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this motor apart. We're gonna take a look at how a stepper motor is assembled. Uh, the internal structure of it. They're rather simplistic, but I think they're pretty neat. Uh, so we'll go ahead and take this apart and we'll talk about the pieces that we have inside. Uh, while, I'm going, while I'm taking these screws out, uh, the difference between a stepper motor and a regular electric motor is that a stepper motor doesn't spin when power is applied. Uh, you know, you, you hook up voltage AC or DC to a standard AC or DC motor and it starts spinning, right? Um, stepper motors are a little different. They have a series of windings inside that those windings can uh, aid in the, the speed of the motor as well as the direction of the motor uh, in, as well as locking it. You can actually freeze a stepper motor in place with the windings and that's a normal acceptable thing. Um, so what happens is there's a large number of windings in two different coils and you can drive both in the same direction, opposite directions locks the motor, you can engage one, release one and just step the motor in tiny degrees. Uh, so this one is 1.8 degrees, it's pretty standard for stepper motors. Uh, but what that does is it allows the motor to position itself in space through the motor controller, where if it was just a spinning motor, it'd be very hard to lock it in a single position, as well as um, you know, determine where it was in space without a separate uh, you know, registering device on, on the, the item that was moving. Okay, so we're just gonna tap this out here. It just helps pop that cover off, drive the motor shaft out. These are in here pretty tight, and I'll show you why in a second. There we go. So here's our cover, and that's you know just an aluminum cover, no big deal. There's a bearing on the end of the stepper motor. This is the drive side. This is where the shaft had sheared off of that the pulley was mounted to. Okay, so we're gonna take that out, and now this is interesting. The motor itself, it seems very, very hard to get out. It's not that it's actually hard to get out. It's that this is essentially just a a huge magnet or series of magnets technically if you want to look at it that way. So right there you see it's bouncing back in and now it's going to stick to the bench. Boom. Okay. So now we've got down here just a little uh, spring washer on the bottom and a bearing on the other end. Okay. And there's our motor just our armature just stuck. I mean stuck stuck. That's hard. It's probably neodymium magnets or rare earth something along those lines. Okay, so there's the actual shaft. What we're gonna see is if we can press this shaft out or not. I don't know if that can be done. This motor's no good as is, so it can't hurt to try. So we're gonna try and press that out. Okay. So we'll put these away. And here's the inside of the stepper motor. 
Okay, and all it is is coils, and it looks very similar to any other motor, except these coils can engage and disengage in tiny steps that are basically noted between these lines here. So that motor can increment in space. So we're not too much into stepper motors, but you can see how simple they are inside. Right? This is a magnet. It's not electrically engaged, so there's no commutator. There's no anything in there that electrically connects the armature to the motor housing, which differs significantly from AC-DC motors. Um, some brushless motors have this same kind of idea, but you get the point. Okay. So we've got our motor out. We're going to put our spring washers just in here. They go in the bottom we'll just, so we don't lose them. Take our cap and we'll put it back on top and set this aside. And let's take this guy. And what we're going to have to do is a, uh, slide it, it's a two-phase thing. We're going to see first if we even can press this out. And if we can, we're going to have to press it, press it through a bearing, through the whole body, and then we'll have to turn down a shaft of the correct diameter and press that right back in again. So I'm going to go ahead and get this set up, and we'll see if we can even press this. Okay, so here we are set up in the press, and you can see we've got our armature, all right, with the bearings on each end, and a piece of pipe that, you know, the bearings fit inside, so we have something to press into. And I don't think you'll be able to see this on film, but in here, inside of this, sh this armature, this shaft, I can see a few lines that looks like it was pressed this direction. So it's, if possible, usually easier to continue pressing. So when you have a pass-through, that's pretty good. You know, things distort in the way you're pressing. So if you want to go the opposite way, it can sometimes be a little harder. So what we're going to do is we're going to put this in here. And thankfully, you know, it's magnetic. It sticks to that shaft, that pipe pretty well. So we're going to go and we're going to press this down until it's flush. Okay. And then we won't be able to press anymore. Uh, what I want to do is I want to have the whole uh, pressure on the surface of this bearing here while I'm pressing. Uh, just get it flush that this will act as a support for that bearing then and then once it's flush we're going to put this little ball bearing on there right in the dead center it's gonna be harder to do because that's a non-magnetic center but we'll get that ball bearing in there and just start pressing that shaft downward um, i like using a ball bearing like this uh, if i can it's a little harder on this magnetic piece because it wants to shoot to the side we'll see if that works out um, but it lets us push down without something that's going to tip one way or another you know if the press is a little angled it still gets downward pressure where if you were using a punch or something like that it's a lot easier for it to kick out so when we get it recessed what that lets us do then is put something in here again like a punch but now there's a lip that'll hold it in place hopefully that makes more sense so let's go ahead and get started with the pressing it's going to get a little noisy I apologize for that um, but here we go, we'll see what we get. That went flat pretty easily and the uh, press didn't really make any sort of straining sounds whatsoever. So that was a really good sign. Okay, now we're going to go see if we can get our ball bearing in here. With this being magnetic, I don't know if I'll be able to get that placed or not. So I'll grab a little cheater here. Got a little pair of uh, self-clamping forceps basically. So this. That lets me hold that bearing. I don't have to hold it, so I can get it up in the middle and get some pressure on there without my fingers being in the way. Whoops. Come here. <laughs> Those magnets are really making this tough. Okay. Whoops. There. Dang it kicked on me at the last little second. It, the magnet pulled my tweezers out of the way. Sorry, I'm probably in your view here too. There we go. There we go, and we'll release this. And that's working out pretty good. You can see we've got our recess, the depth of that ball bearing. That way now we'll be able to put in a straight punch and it can't kick out. Okay. So let me go grab a straight punch and we'll come back and press that piece in. 
Okay, so I tilted the camera a little bit so you guys can see a little bit better. Uh, the distance between here and the press is a little bit shorter than my shortest punch that I've got. Or a little bit, yeah, a little bit shorter, so I can't really get that in there easily. So what we're going to do is we're just going to step this up little by little. So I'll just go to longer and longer items that I can get stuck down in there. So I've just got a uh, quarter inch bolt here that we'll go ahead and stick down in there. Get centered up and uh, drive the press down again. Okay, and now we should have our bearing completely free. Go ahead and relieve the pressure on the press, move our bearing, and continue punching that, pushing that through. We're not punching anything really. There's our quarter inch bolt, our bearing comes free just as we had hoped. Great, so now we can grab our next longer punch. Continue using bolts, but I don't know that uh, what my quarter-inch bolt supply is at the moment. I haven't gone and looked. Oh, we're just a hair shy. So we'll put the bolt back in. Uh, now that the bearing's out of the way, we got a little bit more room. There we go. And we'll just press that back down. And we stop just shy, just to be sure that we're not actually going to put any extra stress on this structure. So that bolt isn't fully seated right now. Get that out of there. Now we should be able to fit our next longest punch in here. That should, once this retracts all the way, give us enough room. There we go. Perfect. And now this should be able to take us all the way through. Oh, haha, -ha, the punch won't drop. It's in a magnet, but we can see now that we're through, because there's no more pressure on here, the magnet is just sitting on the punch. So uh, tip this over, there's our shaft and bearing that just came out. We'll go back to the bench over there and examine the parts. All right, here we are back at the bench. We've got our shaft where the uh, end had been, right here, okay. That's broken off of here. Uh, the shaft is, thankfully, a larger diameter than I thought it was. Um, so good and bad to that. I don't know if I have a piece of stainless this big around. Here's the piece I had that I thought was going to be good because it was slightly larger than the shaft diameter. But as you can see, that needs to be turned down. But the good news about this is this will actually be easier to create uh, because, you know, turning down this really, really thin rod was just going to be complicated, having to be done in small sections, etc., etc. Okay, so we got our shaft. We'll take some dimensions off of that. We'll look and see what we got for material. Okay, take our punch out, because that's just sitting in there. Move that to the side. Take our pipe that was nothing more than a spacer block, and here we have our motor shaft. Okay, so one thing we want to do, this was the orientation. I don't know if that matters or not, so we're going to put a mark on each end of this shaft. This is the uh, non-driving side, so we're going to mark here, and we're going to mark here. Now, the position doesn't matter. These aren't for position indicating. This is just so I know that this end was this end, uh, and that's really for polarity reasons. If I were to install this upside down, I don't know what that would do to a stepper motor. Uh, I don't know if it would work, if it would make it run backwards, I have no clue. But we want to make sure we keep our orientations correct, so we mark our ends. Okay, good. 
So now we got basically a big old magnet. So we're going to go ahead and uh, look for material like this, and then we'll pick up with the next step to see if we can fix this thing. So we've got our broken shaft. Everything is disassembled, as you can see. Press the other bearing off uh, while it was, you know, still over there in the press, taking the first one off. So we've got everything done, and here's where it sheared off. Here's what we broke. And uh, again, stainless steel. I can't get that today. Uh, I'd like to get that table going. I have customer orders that are pending. So I, I need to get this motor going. I got another one on order. It won't be here for days, though. So I can't get stainless. Um, I had a stainless bolt that I was thinking about using, but when we look at this, um, we're just too short. I, I don't have room to machine in the bearing surfaces and the length needed by the time this was on here. And you can judge by where the uh, original set screw mark is. And if I line the set screws up, you can see here that, um, let me do this on the other side. Maybe that'll work. So we'll show you here, there'd be the max length. The set screw would be right there. So I would basically only have the width of that collar supporting this. And this has quite a tension load on it and that's gonna turn. Uh, and that eventually is just gonna break the next shaft. So uh, this bolt's not gonna work. I was hoping it was long enough. Uh, we've got some stainless, we've got a few other options. Again, I have this piece of stainless that I could leverage, but what I have that's gonna make this really easy is another stainless bolt with smaller diameter. This is a quarter inch bolt. The important part about that being, this is a quarter inch shaft. So we're gonna drill and tap this. Drill it, tap it, thread this in with some Loctite and uh, go to town. So that will get us back moving. I don't know how long it'll last. Uh, I got another, another motor coming. So let's get over to the lathe, get this set up for some drilling and tapping. Uh, we'll have to go put the collet chuck in, which is always a, a horrible thing to do because the regular six jaw weighs like a friggin' ton. Uh, but we'll set that up and then we'll pick back up over on the lathe. Okay, so this should be a pretty straightforward operation. All it is is drilling and tapping one end of this, um, this shaft. So uh, pretty easy there. It is stainless, so that's going to be kind of a pain in the butt. I hate tapping stainless, uh, but it is what it is, right? So uh, there's some ridges on here from where this was driven in. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to power up the lathe, stone these down to get them as smooth as we can and before we put it in the collet to drill and tap the end that is currently in the collet. So let's go ahead and fire this up and clean up those ridges. And while we're doing this, I can feel them bumping. I'm not sure if you can hear them on the microphone or not. And they're getting softer and softer as they come around. I could go ahead and use a more aggressive, abrasive on this, but in between the ridges is the actual shaft, right? And we're trying to minimize any um, change in dimension because this has to be able to be pressed back in again. We gotta make sure we maintain that press fit capability. And the end up near the chuck is the only end we have to clean up a lot because it's the end that the collet will grab onto. Okay, let's see how we're looking here. Oh, that's significantly better. There's still some ridges, but I'm afraid if we try to go any further, we're just going to reduce that diameter more than we should and put us in a bad spot to bring that shaft back in. So I'm going to go ahead and swap this around, get this back in the collet uh, with the correct diameter collet for the body here and we'll get moving with the drilling and tapping. Okay, so we've gone and double checked that our bolt that we're gonna use is indeed quarter 20. We've got our proper drill bit for a quarter 20 uh, threaded hole using a cutting tap. That's a number seven or a .201 bit. So we've got that all set. We've got our tap lined up. Uh, this sheared off very, very cleanly. Uh, so I don't really need to face this at all. So we're just gonna go ahead and do our center drill, drill, tap. So here we go. Move over a little bit. 
and actually you guys aren't going to get to see much from this position, so I'm going to reposition the camera just a second here. Yeah, we're definitely going to drill that at a lot slower speed. That was getting really hot uh, just doing that, um, that center drill, which is going to work hard, and that stainless almost instantly. So for the drilling operation, we're going to slow this down considerably. Normally, I run drills about 800 RPM, depending on the size, obviously. But that's like my starting point. But I think we're going to come way down, even for this small drill bit, uh, just to avoid work hardening that steel. Uh, and I uh, have to balance that between feed rate, work hardening, temperature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're just going to drop that down to 235 RPMs here. There we go. Get our drill up here. And on here, I like to start, there we go, we're at my zero. And we're going to go a, a half or three quarters of an inch deep to be sure we have lots of threads in there. Just get lined up. There we go. That, that did work hard and like crazy from just that center drilling. It was a lot to break through that. So what we're going to do is we're just going to keep on drilling here. Um, if the material is still hot, woo, careful, you see that? That chip? That's that work hardening happening in that stainless. You can see how hot that's getting. And this is just a high speed steel bit, so you know it's not cobalt or anything like that. Clear those chips often, keep the heat out of there as much as we can. And keep giving it oil. Let it cool. The drill bit, that is. I don't want to wreck my drill bit here. There we go. We're drilling nicely. We got past the work hardening. Excellent. Okay, let's clear that and do a little more cooling. Okay, three eighths of an inch. Coming up on a half. There's a half. We're going to go that three quarter mark. We've got a nice spiral flute tap so we can get nearly to the bottom of this hole, so that'll be good. Alright, one more eighth of an inch to go. You know, a lot of these chips I pull off, but stainless steel chips come off so sharp. I don't want to touch those with my fingers. You know, I don't know if you can hear it, we're crunching on the bottom of that hole where it once again work hardened. You just got to get through that. There we go, just pecking at it to get through. Not sure if you guys could hear that at all, but that was pretty crunchy. Okay, we're almost to three quarters here. Boy, it does not like that. Okay, we are officially done. This drill bit is not going to go any deeper in that hole. We were almost all the way to three quarters. I let off too soon when it was cutting smoothly and it work hardened inside. 
but I, I mean, we're probably a 30 second cello and the three quarter inch um, wasn't a critical measurement. It was just an amount that I wanted to have enough threads. That's all that really was. So I'm gonna switch out here. And if you guys have been watching before, I've modified my hand tap uh, to work in here. A lot of stuff I'll power tap, but I won't power tap stainless like this. There we go. And there's no pressure forward. There's no pressure in this direction from the tailstock. This is strictly holding everything in orientation. So this is 100% by hand. that we're gonna tap this. And yeah, it's it's tough in there. These spiral flutes usually just drive in and tap nicely, but that work hardened stainless is definitely something to uh, to contend with, if you will. Well, here we go. We got our pieces, and we're about a thou and a half too big on this, which is exactly what we want. So we're going to clean these up and heat this, and see if I can just slide it in. If not, we'll put it in the press and press it in. Unfortunately, because uh, I'll need like five hands in order to run the camera, heat this, press it in the whole deal. I'm not going to catch that on camera. But all we're going to do is heat this part up, and you know, you get about a thou for every hundred degrees, and we got about a thou and a half, so it shouldn't be too bad. In order to get that in there. So we're going to acetone these, make sure there's no oil inside, uh, go ahead, heat them up, and boom, press them together. So unfortunately that'll be off camera, I'm sorry about that, uh, but I really don't have another way to do it. If I had a cameraman and a helper, that might be possible. But All right, so I'll come back after doing that, and we'll see how it went. Guess what, guys? I solved my not enough hands problem. So what we're going to do is run the lathe in uh, just a low gear, uh, just to rotate the part. Uh, so let me see, we want to go X, Y, low. Uh, so we're just going to rotate the part while we heat it. Then when we get heated, we're going to use the tailstock to drive the piece in. So I'll basically just hit the uh, foot brake on the lathe to stop it. Thing in here. There we go. I went a little faster than that, I think. There we go. So yeah, we're gonna rotate this piece just so it heats evenly, hit the foot brake, and then boom, drive this in. So let's see if that works for us. Probably should have grabbed my uh, laser thermometer that would have made this a little easier but again we only need to get it a couple hundred degrees we're smoking i'm say that's got to at least be a couple hundred stop in you go oh that went in well snugged up right away i think that was good I'm gonna leave that cool in situation here. And then we're what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to basically just turn this down to a quarter inch. So obviously cut it off, right? Uh, but then turn down to a quarter however much we need. So I'll let that cool and then we'll come back for the next step. All right guys, here we are. All I did is take this over to the bench and just cut that with the cutoff wheel. And now we're gonna measure our shaft distance. So we'll take the original shaft piece, we're just gonna butt it up against where it used to be, and drive that in. Boop. There we go, and we'll set our DRO to zero. That way we just have a reference, and we're just gonna turn down this end to the correct length first, and then we're gonna set the diameter. And we're gonna put the lathe in a little bit higher gear.
Okay, here we are back at the bench. <laughs> one broken tap, one unused bolt, a chunk of stainless steel stock, and our new shaft. You can see we've got our bearing collar still, and our length is pretty much dead on. So I'm going to go put this in the mill, and we're going to cut a flat right here. I'm not even going to catch that on the camera, because it's literally and done. So we'll go or cut that on the mill, and then we'll reassemble everything. The one thing that I know I'm going to have to do, because I didn't think about this the first time, is look at the offset for how far each piece goes in here. Now, when we look inside the body of the stepper motor, there's an interior... Um, windings area with cutouts that look just like these that basically this matches flush so it's not really bad uh, but it would have been nice if i would have measured it in the beginning but yeah over the mill cut some flats in this come back and reassemble everything okay so we're over here in the mill and what i'm going to do is cut a flat in here and there's a couple ways to approach this and this is the reason i decided to record this i wasn't going to but i thought this is pretty neat um so what we can do is we can cut our flat using the end mill. All right, position it over the center, and we can drive in and out and cut our flat like that. Um, and that has two potential downsides to it. One downside is that this side back here is gonna be a sharp corner. Right, when we drive in, it'll be rounded, and then we'll have to cut across to make it a, you know, a, um, a square corner, but it's sharp, and sharp areas are stress risers. So that's one piece of it. The other piece is, if for some reason our stock were tilted this way or this way, that flat across the top surface wouldn't actually be flat. So I know that my vise is tram, it's square to the head. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut the flat on this side with the side of the cutter instead of the end. Right? And what that's gonna do is it's gonna cut a truly parallel flat side, but it's also gonna leave a rounded corner on this back, back half here. And that helps to eliminate that stress riser that would be there if we had a square going all the way across. So we're just gonna drive in a little bit, bring the cutter down. And this flat doesn't have to be much. Again, it's just to hold a set screw. So we'll go here and get everything fired up. And you see our flat starting to emerge. We'll go right into the edge of our bearing seat. There we go. And we're going to come a little more. Give us just a little bit bigger flat. There we go. That looks pretty darn good. Back over to the bench to take a look at the whole thing. There we go. Now it's time for assembly. So we've got our flat in here, as you can see. Okay, got our part in there. Uh, all we've really got to do is press our bearings back on. Press our bearing on. Press this in. I think I'm going to press this first. And then, because uh, I can press the bearings from either end once that's in there. So that's not too bad to do. All right, here we are set up. Got our shaft uh, just setting in the center. We have our support pipe to allow the shaft to press through. And fingers crossed, here we go. So we'll go get some bearings pressed in here next. Let me go grab the bearings, reset this, and we'll come right back. Okay, so I'm gonna do this in two steps. We've got our two bearings that we gotta press on, and I've got a quarter inch socket that fits over my shaft 
but rests on the shoulder. So we're not going to press on the shaft, we just pressed in. Oops, sorry. So this fits over the shaft, but on the shoulder of the internal. So we're going to press the bottom bearing on first. That way we're not pressing on this shaft at all. So we'll press that bottom bearing in. Then we're going to go back and get the uh, chassis, uh, the motor housing, and just determine how much further down this needs to go. And we'll probably press that in the housing. You'll see what I mean when we get there, I guess. So let me get this set up, and we'll press the bearings in here. Bearing. All right, here we go. Get my lever. All right, there's the bottom bearing in. Okay, so here we are with the uh, motor housing, and let's see if you can see inside there. See that internal grooves? The top of these need to be level with the top of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop this in, press it down until it's roughly level, maybe even a little teeny bit low, because remember we had those uh, springs in the bottom. So we're going to just go ahead and drop this in here, get it seated all the way down. Okay, it's all the way seated. Now you can see we have further to go. And we're going to use a piece of pipe right over the top of that just so we can watch what we're doing as we press that in. And what this is doing is it's setting the bottom bearing, or the, the, the shaft on the other end to the proper depth. Okay, let's open that up and take a look. There we go. We're just a little bit low, and I think that our um, spring in the bottom exactly is the amount that we want. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get our other bearing pressed in here in just a minute. And in order to do that, we're going to support this bottom so we don't push that shaft through. We'll do that ball bearing trick like we did before. Support that, put the um, socket over here, and push this top bearing down. Okay, so our bearing's going to slip on. We're going to slip our socket over, which fits right over the bearing race. And then we're going to put that ball bearing underneath, like we had mentioned, to just give that a little support on the bottom so we don't go too far. There we go. Take a look and see how we did. There we go. Looks like we got our, our bearings seated. We'll go over to the bench, put the cap back on here, and we'll be able to tell if we need to adjust anything. Well, here we go. Uh, motors assembled. New shaft is on. We can see where the old shaft had been at one point. All done, so we're going to go ahead and put our gear back on and throw it on the table, and we will be all done with this. I really hope that uh, anybody who stuck around enjoyed this video and uh, found some use seeing the inside of a stepper motor. It was kind of interesting. So I, I kind of like that myself a little bit, being able to get some visibility into those black boxes that we all use. So I'm going to go align this on the table, and we're all set. So I really hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you like watching what we did to repair it. I hope you like the repair method. And if you got any questions, go ahead and comment below. And please do like and subscribe and hit the notify button. I'm trying to gain the, the channel, grow some audience, and that's how the YouTube algorithm works. And if you'd help me out by subscribing below and hitting the little notify bell, that really helps uh, my videos rise up in the rankings for YouTube. Well, again, thank you for watching. I really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoyed the video. I realized I didn't actually have any pictures of the functional repair, um, and it's all BS until we see it working, right? 
okay, so here's the motor that went bad. It's the one we replaced, has the new shaft inside. And this is the belt that early in I said was just hanging down because that had broken off. Uh, let me see if I can get a better angle for you here to see inside here. Okay, yeah, here's that little gear on the end of the stepper motor and that had sheared off, the belt was hanging straight down. And what happens is because this is a dual drive gantry, there's a motor on this end and a motor on that end. That motor was still trying to move. This one no longer had a motor, so it was jamming up and that one was making all kinds of grinding, skipping noises, it was horrible. But what we've got here is I've got this on, I've got my keyboard here real quick so you can just see, this is a functional motor. All right, slow speed, high speed. There we go, there's our repair. Don't know how long it'll last. I do have a new motor on order just in case, but the repair worked. So there it is.